you know, people say, well, the, you know, Ukraine is going to solve the China thing. And it's like, no, actually, you know what China's doing is it's biding its time. It's wearing the Americans out. Welcome to the Jay Martin Show. If you're new to the show, my name is Jay and my guest today is Elbridge Colby. I'm very excited to share this conversation with you. Mr. Colby wrote the United States Defense Strategy in 2018. He was Donald Trump's foreign policy advisor when he was in the White House. and. In the event of a Republican win in the November election, it is highly probable that Mr. Colby finds himself in a very senior role within the White House. My personal guess is that he is appointed Secretary of Defense. It is very likely that you're not going to agree with everything he has to share today. That's not the point. I don't invite guests on my channel just to confirm my own biases. I try to have conversations that challenge those biases so that I can understand the issues better. It's always super important, right, to listen to every side of an argument, the side you agree with and the side that offends you. Today, what we used as a jump off statement for this conversation was Chinese President Xi's um, request to the People's Liberation Army, I shouldn't say request, it was an order, to be ready for a successful invasion of Taiwan in 2027. He did not say he's going to invade. What he said to the PLA is, I want you to be ready for a successful invasion of Taiwan in 2027, whatever should happen, right? Now, we use that as a filter to help us better understand the actions occurring in Europe, in the Middle East, domestic policy decisions in the United States and in China. So fascinating conversation. I encourage you to listen to this one all the way to the end and let me know in the comments if you agree, disagree, what you learned or your thoughts. And as always, right beneath this piece of content is a link where you can subscribe to my weekly essay. I publish an essay every Sunday morning to over 40,000 investors and I distill my thoughts from conversations just like this and many others. We focus on better understanding human nature, biases, heuristics, blind spots, those factors that lead to the best and worst decisions of investors. And also we do our best to interpret geopolitics through the lens of history. I tell a lot of stories, share a lot of history and get phenomenal feedback from my audience. And quite frankly, I love writing it. So join the team of over 40,000 investors today by hitting that link right beneath this piece of content. But here is Elbridge Colby, enjoy. Okay, here I am with Elbridge Colby. Bridge, it's great to have you on the program again. I'm looking forward to chatting with you today and I've got a whole host of directions I want to go, but thank you for making the time. Thanks, Jay. Good to be with you and your, your listeners. So let's let's start here. In, in your book, Strategy of Denial, um, you actually outlined a case, the probability that Russia would start a war in Europe. But despite that, you mentioned and made the argument that the bigger challenge facing the United States was in fact China. However, you know, US policy and public were largely ignoring this fact. Uh, did I capture that correctly? And let's use that as a jump off point for this conversation, if you could expand on, on that statement. Sure, if I, under, if I understand you correctly, that even though the war broke out with Russia, that China remains the, is, the, is the primary threat. Yes, that your thesis hasn't changed despite- My, my thesis hasn't changed at all, exactly. I mean, actually in my book, I. I discussed the possibility of a direct Russian invasion into NATO itself, not just Ukraine, which is not a NATO ally, uh, and and that not changing my in fact, you know, I, not not something that would change my strategy because none of the fundamentals has been changed. I mean, uh, the fact that China is ten times the size of Russia in terms of uh, economic strength and thus ultimately military strength, the fact that you know Europe is less important than Asia. The fact that the European countries are far more power, powerful relative to Russia than the other Asian countries are to, to China. So actually, nothing has nothing has changed. And I think actually, what's what's sort of emerged, um, become clearer in the Ukraine conflict. I, I think there was a, a very unfortunate tendency, understandable but unfortunate, and, and thus not good, for people to be kind of almost like intoxicated by the narrative of the Ukraine war early on, in a way that that. Um, led to some sort of, the way I think about it is kind of magical thinking. Um, and I say that as somebody who thinks that the Russian invasion of Ukraine is an evil act and what Putin is doing is, is terrible and the Ukrainians have a just cause in their self-defense. But there was a lot of thinking that kind of Russia would be moved, you know, removed as a strategic power, that they would be decisively defeated, um, that even with just a little bit more effort by the United States and, and the Europeans and the Ukrainians, that it, they could be kind of taken off the quote-unquote game board. You know, essentially what we've had uh, over the last, I would say, kind of year is a reversion to the mean, 
more or less what you would expect in a large uh, state on state war, especially a large state on state ground war, which is an attritional conflict in which numbers resolve staying power, numbers of personnel, numbers of munitions, industrial capacity is what matters. And so now we're in a quite a bad situation. And actually, the fact that the war is likely to go on uh, for some time, it actually calls again for all the more focus. This is what I was trying to draw before the Ukraine war started is we need to keep our eye on the main prize. And, and we have really failed to do that. Mm. Um, OK, I want to I want to pull on a bunch of those threads in Europe in a minute. But first, I want to stay with China. So, you know, if I understand correctly, Xi, President Xi has essentially told the PLA to be ready for a successful invasion of Taiwan by 2027, which, you know, I, I think is an important statement to maybe begin the next part of this conversation, because that's the long game that China's playing. You're right. You know, we tend to get wrapped up in the near term headlines. The war in Ukraine is happening now here, you know, but what is the bigger priority, right? Which is what you've outlined here. So, so walk me through that timeline. If we continue to become invested in the war in Europe and China continues to invest in their, I mean, they haven't outright said what they're going to do in 2027, but they've dropped some hints, right? Um, w walk me through what we should be paying attention to in terms of their preparedness, their military investment and competency, uh, specifically relative to ours. Sure. Well, the first um, first thing to, to bear in mind is that 2027 is not a prediction. So as Admiral Sam Paparo said in his uh, confirmation to be, he's up for the commander of Indo-Pacific Command, he said 2027 is just what's called a forced development timeline that, that Xi Jinping has given the People's Liberation Army. It's not saying I want to, I'm going to invade Taiwan in 2027. It's just saying I want you to be ready mm. by 2027, which also is, I believe, the 100th anniversary of the People's Liberation Army. So it has some symbolic value as well. Now, what that fundamentally tells you is that he's pretty much clearly communicated the intent that he he wants the military to be ready. In addition, the fact that he's fired a bunch of PLA rocket force generals, for instance, or what used to be called the rocket force, uh, suggests that he's serious about holding people to account. More important than any of that is the fact that China has been undertaking and continues to undertake in the face of economic headwinds a massive military buildup that is both focused on resolving the Taiwan issue favorably for Beijing, but also assumes over time, clearly, that they have resolved the Taiwan conflict, the Taiwan situation in their favor. They're building military forces and a basing architecture that assumes they've broken out of the first island chain. And that's very telling. The other thing that's very worrisome is that I don't think there's any plausible alternative to what um, to 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 uh, unifying Taiwan other than through force. It's very clear that people on Taiwan do not want to become part of the People's Republic. That's they voted for a DPP president uh, for the third straight term. In fact, one who's even more pro-independent leaning than the previous one. Um, and also there's other economic reasons, uh, I think, why China might look to the military instrument, uh, particularly a potential for you know, greater tariff walls, a bit difficulty uh, exporting their excess capacity, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that together leads me to think that conflict is very possible. So I, my view, and I said this on Squawk Box a few weeks ago, uh, you know, my view is that it, we, it's hard for me to imagine us getting out of this decade without either a conflict or a, a military crisis along the lines of the Cuban Missile Crisis or the Berlin Crisis during the Cold War. Uh, because I think China has a very strong structural incentive to consider the use of military force if we take its aims as given, which, you know, the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, unification of Taiwan, et cetera. And of course, you know, talk is cheap. So right now we're talking in February, the last couple of months, they've been making more pleasant noises, but of course they have an interest in deception. Talk can change from one day to the next, one minute to the next. Capabilities are what really matter. Capabilities take a long time to build. They reflect a deeper intent and they create options that didn't exist in the past. So the bottom line for investors is like, I think something, as Paparo said, something could happen tomorrow. It's not impossible. It also, it's possible that nothing will ever happen. This is a probabilistic assessment, highly dependent on the military balance and perceptions of the military balance. And so the Ukraine issue looked at it from more of an uh, analytical perspective, has clearly consumed a lot of American political capital, money and weaponry uh, and sort of uh, attention of the defense industrial base away from and away from the, the first island chain. And so. You know, right now, China is benefiting greatly. And of course, now the United States is enmeshed in another Middle East semi-conflict and 
shooting up, you know, I think we sh shot essentially a year's worth of, I think it was Tomahawk, it might have been SM-6 missiles, just dealing with the, the Iranian mm -hmm. proxy groups and the Houthis. So, uh, you know, I mean, it's, um, I think that gives you a sense of, uh, you know, that China essentially is benefiting. I think, again, what, you know, you mentioned, um, you know, looking at the kind of deeper trends. I think if you're, you know, obviously investors are looking to make day-to-day -day plays as well as longer trends. But I think if you're looking at the longer term, I think the, 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 you can only prudently bet on um, the possibility of significant confrontation uh, along the Fort Island chain between the United States and China. Well, my audience is generally speaking long-term value investors. So yeah. that's the, okay. you know, those, those well, are the then I think, I mean, I, you know, then I think you're basically saying, I mean, China is doing everything it would need to do to get ready for a major confrontation. Obviously, the military buildup, the conventional forces for Taiwan, and then beyond. Secondly, the nuclear buildup. The only reason you would do that, and it's very provocative, is because you think you're going to fight a war with the Americans. Third, making the, the, the economy more resilient to sanctions, heavy sanctions, even in the face of significant economic headwinds they've been facing over the last six to 12 months. Why would you do that unless you actually thought you would be subject to very significant economic sanctions? Why would those economic sanctions be levied? Only because there's a war. Because if we have levied those sanctions in advance of a war, essentially provoke a war. And then fourth, Xi Jinping has actually been saying, I want the, like, national security is important. The Chinese people should be ready for extreme circumstances. So if you're looking at long-term trends, I think that's, that's clearly the direction. And then I would say, you know, decoupling is a more complex issue. And I think actually sometimes people exaggerate how much decoupling there would be, even in the event of a war. Bear in mind, Ukraine and Europe are affected, excuse me, Russia and Ukraine or Russia and Europe are still trading in, in some ways, even directly, but certainly indirectly. So I think commerce is likely to actually continue even in the event of a conflict. Obviously, there would be significant elements of decoupling. But where I do think you're going to see a macro structural rise in need is in the American industrial base because, and, and, and the defense industrial base, not necessarily the existing primes, but also not necessarily the, the sort of spunky better. I, I'm not making a particular recommendation, but we don't, we're not able to produce the weaponry that we need for a protracted war with China. And if what I'm saying is right, we're either going to get a protracted war with China or you're going to get strategic behavior that's happening under the shadow or of that of the anticipation of how a war would go. And we have to be able to produce our own stuff at scale. And, and that's that's going to involve that's not like cosmetic surgery. That's like deep surgery to the American economy and probably economies like those of Canada and, and close allies, the United Kingdom, Japan, Australia, et cetera. Let me ask you a question. I want to maybe step back for a minute here and and dig into the idea that China is the United States' biggest challenge. Now, you could look at the war in Europe and say, what's Russia going to do? I mean, the case that you outlined says if this becomes a war of attrition, Russia is just going to win simply because they have 10 times the, the people, the, you know, the, the uh, military capabilities are far greater and just through a war of attrition, they win that. And Russia usually starts wars badly and and takes a ton right. of casualties and then gets it together and just yeah. through force and numbers. Right. You know, so this isn't out of the playbook. You can look at the conflict in the Middle East and say there's some serious implications here of which direction this could go. Why is China the greatest challenge um, when you consider, you know, all the conflicts that are occurring right now? Why is this why is this the most important one? What's the significance, Bridge? Because China is so much stronger. I mean, that's what matters in the world because intentions change and there's in, in reasons for deception. I mean, it's like, it's just common sense, honestly, because, I, you know, the Iranians can be malign as, as malign as they, as they are, I guess, you know, the Iranian government, but they just are a lot less powerful. And if you combine uh, power with greater ambition, which you are, which, which is inevitably happens because of human nature and structural incentives, um, then you get the most dangerous combination. So China's like, it's an order of magnitude larger economy than Russia, and it's close to two orders of magnitude larger than uh, Iran. And even if, yes, China's facing very significant economic headwinds, but from a geopolitical and military point of view, 
it's not clear how much that matters because most of the stuff that they're producing for their military and so forth is denominated in yuan. So like when people say, oh, they're never going to catch the size of the American economy denominated in dollars, that's sort of missing the point since like most, I mean, they're already a large, in fact, Putin pointed this out in his interview with Tucker Carlson, they're already a larger economy when measured in the ways that you would actually measure industrial production. Like they, I mean, frankly, a lot, and I know a lot of your your, your listeners are more in the, the, the sort of natural resources and kind of that sort of, you know, sort of more the basics. So they probably, this probably is sort of, they're sympathetic to this, but I mean, a, a lot of the American economy is denominated effectively in kind of rents, you know, and like technologies that require people to pay, um, you know, pay a fee or whatever, right? I mean, mm-hmm. obviously, I don't want to understate it because, like, the American, the United States, economy, the U.S. economy is clearly at the forefront. But in terms of industrial capacity, and if the Chinese could could secure a hegemonic area in Asia that blocked our, say, technology companies from competing at scale, they're going to overtake us. Mm-hmm. The Russians can't do anything like that. They're, they can't right. even get. They're they're having tr- difficulty getting over the, the Dnieper River in Ukraine. Right. Right. So this is, this is, I mean, we need to actually apply a bit more the model um, of how we look at the world economy, which is like, obviously, China and Asia are much more important than Russia and Europe, right? I mean, if you're a business and your future is dependent on growth in Europe, you're not a very good businessman because the European economy is, is slowing and demographically, it has a lot of problems. Obviously, you know, it's a mature economy, a wealthy economy in some ways. But clearly, the growth in the, in the global economy is going to happen in Asia. Geopolitics, because power and ultimately military power comes out of economic productivity at scale, should be we should have the same logic applied in in geopolitics. Hmm. I, I have to ask. I'd love to ask, and just because you mentioned yeah. it, what's your take, or what were your takeaways from Tucker Carlson's interview with Vladimir Putin? Um. Well, I think the biggest one, and I, I, I got, I haven't gotten quite to the end yet, but I mean, the biggest one was that um, Putin did uh, express openness to negotiations. And um, that may be insincere or deceptive. I mean, it's a classic technique. I mean, Putin's not a communist, but he grew up in a communist system. But it's a classic technique that the communists have employed repeatedly to get us into negotiations and then drag them out. I mean, it's not just a communist thing, but... On the other hand, the administration itself has said um, that this war is going to end through negotiations, and yet they rejected out of hand Putin's openness to negotiations. And I think this connects to a lot of the skepticism towards ongoing support for Ukraine and the fate of the supplemental bill, which is like, what's the strategy here? You know, how, how is this war supposed to end? To quote David Petraeus, how does this end? You know? And I didn't see, and that, that was my big, you know, I mean, he, he, Putin went on and on about, and I, I thought Tucker actually put it pretty well. It's like lots of countries have territorial disputes, but like that doesn't justify going to war. Um, <clears throat> so I think the biggest takeaway, but I also thought the takeaway and actually apropos of what we're talking about here is that Putin's read of the global power balance is actually struck me as like not totally off base, right? The guys like China's a lot bigger industrial economy, the overuse of sanctions and the dollar. I mean, obviously he's talking his own book there, but you know, he seems to have a, you know, his his he's not detached from reality of looking at the, at the total geopolitical picture. Obviously, his invasion of Ukraine is is a malign act, but you know, people can see things rationally and still do bad things. But I thought, you know, that that also you know, Putin himself, um, I think it's going to be hard for there ever to be any kind of rapprochement with him and given what he's done and so forth and so on. But the Russian system, looking forward and looking beyond, hopefully, the end of a war, you know, or at least, uh, you know, there are there are structural issues that, invo- that that Russia is falling into where it's becoming essentially a dependency or or an appendage of the Chinese system and the Chinese economy. And that's, you know, that's an inherently uh, fraught situation for Russia. And so, you know, I mean, there's still, you know, he, you know, I just was, 
the history lesson thing was, I think, fell on deaf ears, and I don't think it was very effective at convincing anybody that their cause is just or anything. Um, but he didn't like, uh, you know, once he'd gotten through that, it wasn't like a totally unhinged, sort of highly emotional, detached from reality kind of assessment of the global situation, which leads me to think, you know, again, like maybe when he's offering or, or, or at least uh, sincerely or not expressing openness to a negotiation that at, at some point, if the Ukrainians were properly armed and if they were successful enough, there could be an end to the an end to the conflict and um, a situation that would be uh, that would not involve like marching to the Kremlin, for instance, which is obviously mm -hmm. totally untenable or implausible as a strategy. So that was sort of my my kind of takeaway. Interesting. Okay. Um, so if, if you walk through, uh, this sequence of events, so yeah. G has informed the PLA, he wants them to be ready to be successful of an invasion right. of Taiwan by 2027. Um, meanwhile, the United States is being drained of resources right now, fueling and, and funding this war in Ukraine and, and now a secondary conflict in the Middle East. I mean, I think you've come out and said, you know, what, what the U.S. needs is NATO to essentially appoint a European leader, and that right. leader should be the U.K. At present, the U.K. is like horribly uh, unready, right, to be right. any kind of a military leader, right? Uh, their their investments in the yeah, military they're, they're up here haranguing us about it. It's like, why don't look at your own, remove the moat from my own eye, friend? Yeah. So, so let me ask you, like, what's your take on are European countries doing enough to support no. Ukraine? No, and cool. and why aren't they? Is this because yeah. the United States has been so proactive they can take a back yeah. seat, or is there something else occurring? Yeah, so it's it, to be clear, uh, they're not doing enough, obviously, and it's not just about meeting ten percent, two percent from like a fairness point of view. This ultimately reflects a structural reality in which the United States faces a pure adversary, really, for the first time in 150 years, and we frittered away a lot of our military resources in the Middle East, and we've gone deeply into debt. And we spend a lot more on healthcare costs. So, you know, it's idle, essentially, to use a term, to talk about like doubling the defense budget to solve all this problem. It's not going to happen. So the U.S. has is confronted by a situation of scarcity, like a business. And in this, you have to rationalize if you're going to survive as a business. And so we can't meet all of the, you know, franchise commitments or whatever we had all over the world. So we have to pick the most important and we got to go, you know, just like a common sense business approach, which is make sure you get your top priority right. I mean, Steve Jobs, right? Don't take it from me. Which is not what we're doing now. We're doing the opposite. We're like, we can do everything. We're the global leader. We don't have to make any choices. So our foreign policy is completely out of whack with, with our actual resource level and the threats we face and the and the um, and the military readiness that we have. The obvious, the the clear solution to this is that our allies actually themselves have the capacity to do a lot more to defend themselves. Um, they have not done the, the, this thus far enough. Um, why is that? So, you know, ultimately this, this is not a morality play, but it's useful to understand why. It's not only their fault, it is their fault. They ignored the Americans for a long time who were talking about this, but it's also our fault and particularly our foreign policy establishment's fault because we actually, our foreign policy establishment and our political leaders actually wanted Europe and other countries like Japan to take a back seat. So people like Madeleine Albright and George W. Bush would talk about the United States as the indispensable nation and we see farther. And so there is this deal essentially between the foreign policy establishment and our allies, which is like the way I used to put it is like, you know, we get to be the leaders, we see farther, we, we're the leader of the coalition and you put out more flags. Okay, you know, when we call on you, the British and the Australians being a lot more involved, but most countries basically involved in sending like token forces, and then they could save the money and put it into their welfare systems or whatever. And that deal, I don't think it was advisable at the time, but it was not catastrophically crazy 20 years ago. That system does not work anymore. And has not, and it's been clear that it's not working anymore because it demands too much of the American people. So again, it's not just Europeans fault. It's also the American elites fault, but that's, that doesn't matter now. Now, the other problem is that people like President Trump and President Obama, for that matter, and Secretary of Defense Robert Gates have been warning the European, me at a smaller level, have been warning the Europeans and the Japanese about this and the Taiwanese for some time, and they've, they, they really ignored it. 
Now, I think some American leaders, including President Biden, but also some Republicans, really hurt this cause by going to Europe and saying, don't worry, we can handle this. We're America. Because that's not true, and it's not sustainable. And the reaction to supplemental shows that. Whatever happens with the supplemental bill, it's clear where things are going. That it reflects a deeper structural issue and, and political vibes that reflect that structure. So what Europeans need to do is, and, I, and my friend, uh, Ambassador Boris Ruga, who's at NATO now, used to be at the Munich Security Conference, he said, look, Europe should not wring its hands. Europe should step up and spend more. <laughs> 2%. It's just a figure. It's really more of a floor than a ceiling. Mm -hmm. The important thing is that the Europeans should be able to have conventional military forces that handle most of their own self, their defense. Like, and we know, like Germany alone is a larger economy than Russia. Certainly, if you even if you're using purchasing power parity, the European economies are far larger than Russia. So this is, and by the way, they all had huge military, big militaries, impressive militaries during the Cold War. So it's just a matter of will. And for instance, the, Pol the Poles are, are an example. They're spending 4%. Is it difficult? Yes, it's difficult. But your alternatives are haranguing the Americans, which is not likely to work, A, and B, could put too much pressure on the system and like cause it actually to break. Or you can do nothing and hope the Russians won't do anything. I personally think the Russians are very dangerous. The way I think about them is like a dangerous predator. I would not want to be just totally vulnerable to a dangerous predator. I wouldn't provoke a dangerous predator unnecessarily, but I would be ready. So that's, you know, that's like, this is a, this is a tractable problem in a country like Canada. It's a G7 member spent apparently prime minister Trudeau. I mean, I was just like shocking gall of prime minister Trudeau to say like openly saying that there's no way that Canada is going to meet its 2% obligations, but struts around like it's a global leader and it should be a respected country. It's like, are you kidding me? Americans spend three and a half percent of our income on defense and we don't have free health care. So it's over now. Now it's gotten to the point. Unfortunately, I mean, I put a thread out in mid-February about this. Like I've been warning the Germans in German. I don't speak German, but I've had to translate it for like five or six years about this, like in prominent outlets, not in like some random corner of the blogosphere. Like and they just ignored it. But you know, now now we don't have any good choices. So, but is are the Americans going to internalize the costs of this or the Europeans? And I think it's not going to be the Americans. I don't think that's, it's not, it wouldn't be rational. It's not fair. So it's not likely to happen. You know, when I think about the objections to uh, investing more aggressively in the military for European countries, but also for North American countries. Okay, so you think about about Poland, they're investing at 4%. But mm -hmm. over the last several centuries, you'll you'll see that Poland gets invaded all the time. You know, this yeah. is a country that is super vulnerable. Right. Now, you, you think about that. The their investments in defense. They know that. <laughs> exactly, right? There's yeah. a direct correlation yeah. there. I mean, right. they've, they've lived this history uh, right. many times over again and again right. and again. Um, and not to say that, you know, the majority of Central Europe hasn't because you have so many countries sharing one continent. There's constant conflicts throughout history. This this happens. But I, I think culturally, here's where I'm going. I think culturally about these countries, the UK, Germany, and, you know, what's the appetite within those, uh, within that public for increased military investments? And I mean, for, forgive the kind of crass language, but, you know, have have we trended a bit just too woke and divided mm -hmm. To actually unify behind something as um, raw but fundamental as military. Um, I, so, I mean, I have a lot of thoughts privately on that. I would just say, kind of from a strategic or macro perspective, that like I don't know, uh, but if they don't, I think they will be much more vulnerable to that predator I mentioned. And weakness invites weakness invites aggression. Now, provocation can also invite a kind of aggression or defense. So I'm not like a blinkered fanatical hawk, but I think if you're Russia, especially now, like if you're Putin and the Kremlin, they, they think they're in a, you know, kind of a semi cold, semi hot war with the West. Like, I don't think you want, I agree with a lot of these European leaders who are saying there's a real risk of Russian aggression in the coming years. Do they want, is there an appetite to do it? No. But you know what? There isn't an appetite to do it in the United States either. And we're already doing three and a half percent here. So like, yeah, I get it in Germany, but A, 
prudentially, it's your it's your only practical option if you're in Germany. And and like we're not talking about ten percent. We're talking about mm. restoring some kind of capacity that they had in 1988. So it's feasible. You know, Britain like. The Johnson government said that they were going to go to 3%. Now, Sunox walked that back. Like, they got a lot of problems. America's got a lot of problems. You know, Norway, Denmark, they've been spending a ridiculously low fraction on defense. They're very wealthy countries. Yeah, I mean, maybe you're going to, I don't know, some social programs or green initiatives or healthcare stuff is going to have to go by the wayside. But at the end of the day, my point is, like, the Americans are not going to internalize the cost of this. It's going to be the Europeans, in my view. Like, just practically. And, um, you know, I also think, like, if anything, they have more, they have a historic obligation. I mean, the Americans have been carrying a disproportionate share of the burden for 75 years. So, if anything, the Europeans should be doing it, especially the Germans. If anybody has a moral obligation, it's the Germans, right? Mm. So, that's what I've been telling them. I don't know. I, th I think it's happening. Because I think they're now afraid both of Russia and they're afraid that the Americans might not be there. So when people say, oh, but you're this now you can't trust the Americans. And, I'm, and my reaction is, yeah, there are limits to how far the American people will go. So you should make sure you have some autonomous self-defense capability, both for yourself in case we decide not to. But also because if you're more defensible, more, we're more likely to help you out. Right? Yeah. God helps us help themselves. Yeah. 100%. You know, you made a comment there, Bridge. You said weakness invites aggression. And it struck me because I I hear that and I, I receive it as like a, a timeless law of human nature. And we can... Yeah, animals, right? I mean, exactly. Me too. We can yeah. pretend that we've evolved past this, right? Until we're going to end up having to learn the hard way that we haven't, right? Which is maybe right. the lesson that certain Euro European company countries are vulnerable to right now. But the flip side of this is that the best way to avoid a conflict is to be incredibly prepared for that. Exactly. Right? And, exactly. you know, the, the most strategic way that China could take Taiwan, for example, is by showing up in 2027 armed in such a way that makes it a no brainer. We can do this should we want to, uh, then you can do right. so without That's conflict. win without fighting. Win a lot of people fighting. talk about how the Chinese have a different strategy. No, no, no. Their win without fighting is like when they decide that they've got unquestionable superiority they put a gun to taiwan's head and they say are you feeling lucky punk <laughs> then right. what's taiwan's option do you want to turn into ukraine and lose anyway or do you just say and maybe the chinese let five hundred thousand people get out of the country but they don't want anyway that's that's that that's terrible that's like hitler going into and i mean hitler analogies i, I don't mean like the, to compare hitler to xi jinping to hitler as an individual or nazism to contemporary china but I do mean that like Hitler could take over Czechoslovakia without having to fire a shot because he could browbeat because he could coerce people. When he, yeah. when he put the gun to the head, they blinked. So let me walk through a couple scenarios with you. Uh, again, revisiting 2027, I keep on coming back to this as a, a, a bit of a point, but this will be the next American administration. It, it might be Biden. It might be Trump. I suppose it could be a third candidate. And First question for you, would you expect the response to um, a, a Chinese invasion of Taiwan to be dramatically different between the Democratic and Republican parties in 2027? Well, I think under so so my view is that U.S. foreign policy is highly um, it, it's it's visible front is highly uh, variable, but actually there's fair amount of consistency over time because foreign policy tends to reflect structure. So American presidents have now been trying to get out of the Middle East for 15 plus years since, you know, and in different ways. Um, you know, we, we now talk about prioritizing China. So the, the debates tend to be more about um, how far to go, what, you know, how much you rely on military force and so forth. So um, I think that uh, basically the, Republicans, especially a more um, America first oriented Republicans, are go not going to be uh, ideolog you know, sort of inclined to get into a massive war uh, over Taiwan for the sake of democracy or something. Right. People are fed up with that kind of thing. I think they could be convinced. And this is what I spent a lot of my time doing, convinced to fight a war over over Taiwan with China because it's in their interests economically, 
and you know, from a from a political point of view, but really economically, that it's concretely in Americans' interest not to allow China to dominate Asia, and Taiwan is critical to that. Um, so, and my my impression is that the Chinese would invariably be more worried about the Republicans because uh, they're more likely to use force directly when they decide to do so. They're less fettered, and Republicans tend to see China much more clearly as the number one threat. Democrats, President Biden has talked to, has talked about defending Taiwan, but he has not dedicated the resources and attention to substantiate, really to prudently substantiate that pledge. And thus, I think what you have right now is my friend James Crabtree wrote a good piece about that, where there's a potential for a, a run on the geopolitical bank uh, with, with President Biden, where he's trying to be everywhere but not backing it up with like increases in defense spending or, yeah. you know, uh, an inflation reduction act for the defense industrial base, for instance. And so um, I think that um, in that case, if the Chinese were to move, there is a greater danger of essentially a kind of a symbolic opposition. So think of what the Biden administration is preparing to do with Ukraine until the Ukrainians, to people's surprise, fought much better than people had expected. The Biden administration was preparing to lose Ukraine and kind of deal with the consequences. And so I think that is, and, and Biden will be, you know, this kind of global idea, which effectively tends to, to get him focused on Europe and the Middle East, which I think is part of China's goal here. Hmm. But I think that is, um, you know, the, the basic problem that Taiwan faces is that defending Taiwan against a, a China that is so powerful and is preparing so avidly for that conflict is going to be very costly and risky. So it's really, really, really important for Taiwan to be as tough a nut to crack as possible. And they're not doing that. Right. Now, was it not Trump when he was in office was asked about the American response to a Chinese invasion of Taiwan? And, you know, he said a lot of things somewhat flippantly. Uh, so maybe this was one, but he essentially said, look, it's it's thousands of miles away. There's nothing we could do. Um, do you think that reflects his actual policy intention? Should he be back in the seat in this scenario? I mean, as an, as an objective, like I don't live in America, so I think I look at it maybe with a bit of objectivity. Removing all the sensational headlines and hyperbole, he's always struck me as a deal guy. Like this is mm -hmm. a guy who likes to go in and get deals done, avoid conflict. Um, what what would your take be on his response personally? Well, I like making deals and and, and avoiding conflict myself. So I mean, I you know, and putting putting our interests first. I, I I would not want to be seen in any way as presuming to to speak for the president or or just to kind of characterize his terms. But what sure. I would say then is. Um, our formal policy is one of strategic ambiguity. So, like, that is our policy. Um, so, you know, partially for exactly that reason is that we want, and I believe that China should understand that there is the potential for an outcome for peaceful unification. What exactly that would look like, I don't know, mm. et cetera, et cetera. But right. um, I also think that President Trump, under his administration that I served in, focused on China, like my book, Strategy of Denial. I mean, it's my own thinking, but a lot of it is what we did in the Pentagon under, under his administration, which was focus on China, peace through strength. Let's not get in, in the forever wars again, but let's focus on the big, the big guy, China, in order to avoid a war. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, to me, actually, the right policy is speak softly, just to say, be open to deals, don't push China too much in the corner, but carry a big stick, which is to say, if the Chinese cross us, we are not going to be messed with. That is the right, the right balance. And so what I fear we're doing right now is we're talking a big game. We're talking about Taiwan. You know, President Biden said, well, he's going to defend Taiwan. You have a lot of American politicians going to Taiwan and talking about, I mean, you even have an American politician talking about Xi Jinping as Hitler, you know, really provocative. But without backing it up with the military forces that would be needed to substantiate a defense of Taiwan. So I, I think a more, um, again, that more speaks softly and carry a big stick approach is what we want. Yeah, and I, I hate to say it, but like, would you think I'm way off base if I said, I kind of see that as the strategy being laid out in China, right? They're investing aggressively in military positioning accordingly. Yeah. 
not saying they're going to invade Taiwan, but saying we'll be ready. Bingo. We'll be ready. I mean, exactly. And like the war, you know, people say, well, the, you know, Ukraine is going to solve the China thing. And it's like, no, actually, you know what China's doing is it's biding its time. It's wearing the Americans out. It's we're, we're spending a lot of money. We're sending over a lot of weapons, a lot of political capital. Biden's only thinking about Europe. Then the Middle East breaks out and we're shooting advanced missiles at like guys in Yemen. I mean, seriously, come on. Right. Meantime, China's just, even in the face of economic headwinds, boom, boom. I mean, incredible vessel production, right? Et cetera, et cetera, munitions production. And just, and then saying, oh, yeah, um, yeah, no, we want peace. You know, we want blah, 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 blah. Like, we, we need a stable relation. Here's some, like, minor thing we're doing on fentanyl or climate, or we'll talk to your military guy. But nothing has changed. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm not saying that, that war is inevitable. But I'm saying if I if I were ruthless, if I were like deeply serious about pursuing the objective of seizing Taiwan and ultimately ejecting the Americans from the Western Pacific, that is what I, that is how I would pursue it. And by the way, bear in mind, the Japanese were negotiating with the United States on December 6, 1941. That's right. So that's right. You know, look at what they're doing, not what they're saying. Hmm. OK, I want to uh, I want to pivot maybe to a couple comments from a, a mutual friend of ours, I believe, Pippa Malmgren. You know, she she takes a, a unique take, I, I guess. Right. Anyways, a, a quote that I, I pulled from here, her a couple of weeks ago was she was analyzing the global conflicts and saying, essentially, look, it's not the 1940s anymore. We don't need to fight the way that the fighting is being done in Ukraine right now. Um, there, there's high tech solutions to a lot of these conflicts. That's where we need to be focusing. And obviously, she's covered, you know, the hot wars in cold places, you know, deep space, deep sea, Internet cables, satellites, all of this stuff. And then just this week or last week, there was all this uh, sort of suspicious or just weird headlines about a new threat coming out of Russia. And then I think just a couple of days ago, it was nukes in space. We're launching, Russia is going to bring nukes to space to disrupt satellite orbit, et cetera. Um, okay, that's a, that's a pretty you know ambiguous uh, okay. outlay there. But what's your take on, on that subject? Yeah, I disagree. I, I actually think war hasn't, the fundamentals of conflict and strategy have not changed that much. I mean, Steve Biddle, who's at Columbia University, has written some some really good stuff about. I mean, technology is. I've actually become come to think over the years that technology is a is a vital ingredient in military success, but it's not um, it's not uh, really necessarily central or or like the primary driver because it's only one part. It's how militaries adapt, and also when you're dealing with a country like China, they have more advanced technology than we do in some areas, and they, they there is no there's ultimately no easy solution for some, depending on, um, you know, a large conf a confrontation between two capable states, right? Like, I mean, the, the you know, kind of most famous example of this would be Vietnam, where we had massive technological overmatch against the Vietnamese communists, but it didn't matter because the way the war was fought and what was at stake, that technology couldn't be employed. And we did employ a lot of technology, but it couldn't be employed in a way that overcame the basics. So the good thing we have in the case of China and Taiwan is it's, it remains as difficult as it did 400 years ago or when Napoleon was thinking about invading Britain. It remains hard to build an invasion fleet and get and sustain forces across it. That's the fundamental thing. And the political entity that we're dealing with is that that's the nature of, of, of the situation. But ultimately, it's it's going to be. A, I mean, I'm a Clausewitzian in the, in the in the kind of world of strategy, which is like, and I think the Chinese are too. Which is that ultimately, you know, if you want to take Vienna, take Vienna, it's Napoleon. But it's like a direct measure. And and what we're seeing in Ukraine is like, yeah, both sides. I mean, Eric Schmidt's writing about drones and stuff, but drones are being used as part of a larger way of using the force. That's arrayed along uh, essentially trenches that would have been familiar to soldiers in World War One. I mean, they had aircraft in World War I, they had balloons, they had artillery, they had tanks. Like, I don't want to take the point too far, but I think we clearly, we, sh we really should have been disabused of the idea that there are sort of elegant, asymmetric technical solutions. And this is really important to get back to an earlier point I was saying, Jay, which is that if you're investing and you're looking over time, I think the reindustrialization of the United States is a, is a prudent bet. Because we're going to have to produce at scale. 
Mm. We're going to have to produce like old kind of, yeah, it's going to be new stuff, but like our military is not turned into a drone swarm. We're still building big bombers. We're still building submarines. We're still building missiles. We're still building satellites. Like it's going to, there's going to, there is evolution. And in some areas it's very rapid, but overall it's more evolutionary than not. And that means you need to have scale and capacity because as we see in Ukraine, if you start a fight with, with a, super, a great power, it's going to be about attrition. Mm. Yes. Okay. Um, a couple last questions I want to, I want to cover with you. Yeah. Maybe starting with that military investment. So a lot of my audience, I just, I can see it in the comments already. They're going to point to the federal debt. They're going to point to the yeah. debt that they're, they're going right, to say, man. they're going to say how, right? This is not. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I just, yeah, because that's a huge issue. I mean, in the world of defense, I mean, I, I bang my head against the wall because a lot of people in my line of work just say, oh, we should double the defense budget. That'll solve all the problems. Then we can fight China and Russia and Iran and Venezuela and Cuba, whatever. And it's like, hello, what planet are you on? We're like, I'm not the world's, you know, best currency, whatever, you know, market guy. But I, I've, I've heard that there's a big debt to GDP ratio that Jay Powell is saying is a problem, right? And interest rates are going up, and we're having to, and now that like interest on the debt is going to surpass defense spending. Oh, and by the way, both presidential candidates have said Social Security is off the table, which. Obviously, because people are older than they used to be. It's not 1983 or 1961. The demographics of this country have changed, as they have in all countries. We're an aging society, as, as they are in, around the world. And so we, we cannot just like spend our way out of this debt. And this is a huge problem, get to, again, to get back to the mismatch between our foreign policy and our actual, to, you know, to quote Top Gun, we're writing checks our bodies can't cash. Right. Because you have like the Wall Street Journal at the same time it's saying we're spending too much is it is saying increasing defense spending is easy. Well, and by the way, how much, you know, I mean, look at look at the Republicans in the House. A big part of the opposition, the supplemental is tied to concerns about spending, which is they're potentially thinking about shutting down the government. Like, I don't know how that's all going to work, but just to say people are so worried about spending that they want to see fundamental changes that including, you know, drastic steps within the United States itself. So the notion that we're going to dramatically increase defense spending as it exists is, is to me, fantastical. Um, barring some like really significant event that involves the overhaul of our society. But what I'm, what I've been arguing for is not like, Oh, let's just pour more money into the five defense primes. What I've been arguing for is a program that reflects these structural realities that says, look, we're going to have to have reindustrialization in large part because we need a, a robust defense industry again. But that's going to have to be part of, of something that's like sells to hard hat, you know, people like, hey, I make a lot fewer people want to go to college. Maybe speaking of the woke stuff, probably rightly, right? So we want to have a, an economy and a society where people can work, you know, at, at, at the factory that maybe produces cruise ships or warships, mm. you know, that builds munitions, but, or you can go work in another job and build semiconductors or whatever, you know? And so, I mean, that's at the high end, but I mean, I think that's, that to me is plausibly sellable. Um, but I think there's, you know, the fiscal reality is a huge part of what I call the scarcity problem that our foreign policy need, is not dealing with now. Okay. Let me, th thank you for that, by the way. Yeah. Um, let me ask you, uh, probably one of two last questions here. Okay. So we're, we're leading up to an American election. Uh, yeah. Right after that, by the way, is a Canadian election, and and we're becoming up here almost right. as polarized as as in the U.S. Not quite because it's just less people in Canada, right? It's a second largest <laughs> land Canadian style, right? You know, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny, like you know, because my my family's split. My wife's American. I'm Canadian. My kids are dual. We spend okay. lots lots of time north and south of the border. And my yeah. American family is always like, "What are the core differences between Canada and America culturally?" And I, I just say we have less conflict, like there's less tension, and it's because it's a huge country and there's nobody in it. Like it's larger yeah, than America true. with less people in the state of California. And so with less density, you just have less tension. But that being the case, there still is lots right now yeah. um, in Canada and lots in the United States. As we trend towards these elections, I think that's going to increase. Just getting to like a, a human level with you right now, Bridge, what would you mm -hmm. recommend to people who want to be prepared for the uh, sensational triggering events that are coming down the pipeline right now and are going to heat up as we get closer to November, right? 
Um, how, how would you recommend people arm themselves and arm their psychology so they can step back from the noise and the hyperbole and focus on what right. really matters so they can make better decisions? Well, just to be, uh, since you said arm, don't arm up. I'm against political violence. So that would be my, my, my recommendation, uh, just on that, on that front. But, um, look, I think what, I, again, to go back to what my German friend said about, we can wring hands or we can take the actions that we know even as, even will we'll make us better off, even if we don't like the political outcome and to see these things more as reflecting structure and and adapting to that reality rather than kind of like you know i, I use the example of king canute the family you know, uh, danish or english king who would like order the tide not to come up you know it's like i, I mean it, without getting into the, some of the domestic politics like obviously americans are not as willing to both you know as john f kennedy said bear any burden support any friend as they were not as willing after vietnam john f kennedy said that in 1961 we got into Vietnam. Afterwards, the people were like, yeah, no, thank you. We're not going to Central America, mm. you know. And so today, Americans, 20 years uh, in the Middle East, financial crisis, macro slowdown of our economy, greater debt. There's a lot less trust in our establishment, frankly, for good reason. I don't think the establishment has done well over the last 25 years. Uh, inflation, COVID, and then mishandling of COVID, um, lockdowns, etc. So I, I to me, it's like, well, let's try to get where people are coming from. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We need an international system, foreign policy, uh, partnerships, et cetera. I think in the case of Canada, what I would say, and I've been saying this a lot in the Canadian press and on Twitter and so forth, is I think Canada really needs to step up. Like, of all countries, Canada, which presents itself as this moral leader, is really falling down on the on the job in terms of co concrete, you know, Canada's almost like under the Trudeau government is like the the example of performative, you know, it's like performance form policy, you know, it's like posturing. And like, we're not in a posturing world anymore. We're in like a real world. Like we're in like old Canada. We're, we need like more of the old Canada, which Americans love to talk about WW2. It's like Canada was in World War II the whole time. You know, Canada was in World War One the whole time, and it was like the quiet Canadians at Passchendaele, and it, you know, Canadians, a little country, had its own beach at D-Day. Americans only had two. Like, we need more of that Canada. You know, speak softly, carry big. When I think of the difference between Canadians and Americans, actually, you know, Americans are like, you know, what's in it for me? Don't tread on me. It's like the Canadians are the Tories, right? I, the Canadian War Memorial. There's like the Canadian War Memorial. The Americans are the bad guys. But I mean, I, and I say this with respect, albeit as an American, um, is, is the, the, the statue in Ottawa of the, of the brave young boy or teenager who di dove into the water, the icy water to save somebody and, and died. It was like the most Canadian selfless thing. That to me is, I think, like the Canadians are like that. Nobody's given more in the old days to, to collective security and defeating the Nazis and the Germans and so forth in Canada. And that to me is like, now we have a totally different Canada, which is like moralizing to the rest of us and also doesn't really pull its weight at all. It's, and New Zealand is a similar story. So I think that that kind of and I think the United States is going to increasingly look around the world and say, you know, well, first of all, I mean, a Republican in government is going to be different anyway, but it's going to look around the world and say, I'm less interested in what you say than I am in what you do. Mm. You know, you know, like India holds its weight. I mean, speaking of Canada. Like India is really important. India is like up, the Indian army is up there in the Himalayas having like hand to hand combat with the PLA. That's mm. the kind of partner that I think America needs in this world. You know, like, OK, what what's Canada doing? You know, well, you, you ask our prime minister when he got back from the uh, U.N. meeting what Canada's contribution was. And his answer was gender language. That's what that's what we contributed. So what's Canada? Got it. No, that yeah. that'll that'll register. <laughs> you know, that'll register. So you know, and and I've had the former prime minister on my podcast a couple of times, Prime Minister Harper, who prime Minister Harper, yeah, you know, not not old Canada, but there's a leader who took yeah. Canada through the 2008 financial crisis right. with a healthier balance sheet than any of the G7 nation because. I think they understood, he understood, I believe very clearly, the role that a federal leader in this country has to play, which is clear the path 
for the provinces to conduct business. You know, we are laden in the natural resources that the world needs, yeah. but it's right. up to exactly. us whether or not we get them to market, right? And play right. our role, right? Like, and yes. we need it. And that's the industrial the industrialization. We're going to need all those to, to have an industrial supply chain. We're going to need Canadian skills, but also the natural resources. Canada's obviously the ultimate French shore rank, right? Near shore rank. So. Could, could be. And we're, we're seeing, I, I think, great backlash against the federal creep into the business of the provinces from, you know, Alberta, which is where a lot of Canada's wealth comes from right. with the Alberta Sovereignty Act and Saskatchewan with, you know, the right. uh, highest density uranium reserves in the world <clears throat> outside, of, outside of the Kazakhs uh, with the Saskatchewan First Act, very similar, but they're just, they're designed to uh, push back against federal creep and rebuild the sovereignty of the provinces, which is what I love so much about the United States is the sovereignty of the states, you know, and, and as a, a Canadian American family, like we'll probably end up back stateside in the next yeah. few years. But what I love about it is you can kind of choose your own adventure, but like culturally speaking, yeah. right. And I've got right. family in Nebraska and Southern right. California and Oregon right. and Colorado. And it's like, you know, it's, yeah, it's the, yeah, exactly. But, you know, you can pick up and move, you know, Exactly. You can get out of each other's hair. That's the genius of the Madisonian system. Yeah. I, I want to uh, give you a minute to touch yeah. on the marathon initiative uh, sure. bridge and just share what you're up to there with my audience. Sure. Well, my main thing is uh, I do is a marathon initiative is a 501c3 nonprofit where I kind of make the case for this more, I would say, rational and kind of pragmatic American foreign policy. Um, and I'm active on uh, uh, on Twitter, X and um, you know various various media media. And then I'm also, you know, if people want sort of talking, you know, business conferences or what or that kind of thing. I'm also in that in that space as well, because I think my, my, my view is that my perspective well, my main thing is to kind of try to shape the, the U.S. and allied uh, foreign policy conversation in a more concrete and realistic way. I actually think it's also very useful for market participants because a lot of people in the foreign policy space are generally like kind of it's more ideological or kind of, um, you know, it's it's got a, a particular spin. And, and what I'm saying is like, here's what I think is, is reality. And here and there, I think America should adapt its foreign policy based on reality, but it's also relevant to a business audience because it's like, well, you should also be <laughs> adapting to reality because that's where the market's going to go eventually, right? Especially if you're a value investor. So that's something I'm, you know, expanding my my work on as well. Okay. I, I appreciate that. And a very valuable follow on X for anybody. I'll include uh, it just at Elbridge Colby. At Super Elbridge Colby, easy yeah. to find. We'll pop that in the show notes as well. Thank you so much for your time today, uh, Bridge. It's been great chatting with you and, and allowing me to pick your brain for my audience. Very much appreciated. My pleasure has been mine, Jay. All right.